Let us pray. Father God, we just thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. Help us always to know that you're in charge. You created the world. You created each and every one of us. And you blessed this church body with this building. And help us always to be appreciative of our lives. Even though we know we sometimes have hard times. But just help us to love each other and, and help each other through hard times. And, and know that heaven waits. And be with Ken when he brings us the message today and the musicians to bring us the music and help us to worship together. All these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, KMBC kids. I have something here with me that you might have seen in the cafeteria before. If you get a good look at it, looks kind of like meat, smells kind of like meat. Hmm, is it really meat? If you've never seen it in your cafeteria before, I bet your parents probably have. And you might have even heard it referred to as mystery meat. What is it? What's in it? Hmm, that's the mystery. It's made to look like meat and smell like meat, but most of the time, it may not have any meat in it at all. So, what makes us know it's mystery meat and not the real thing? Well, you've seen beef, and chicken, and pork. You know what they smell like, and what they taste like, and what they look like, because you've eaten them, you've been around them. So you can tell the difference between mystery meat and real meat. And you know, there's something else that's made to look like the real thing, but it's not really. And that's a false gospel or false teaching. Ever since the early church, there have been people who would take the words of Jesus and what we learn in the Bible and twist it for their own selfish reasons. They can be very persuasive and make it sound like what they're telling is true. So just like with mystery meat in comparison to real meat, how do we know the difference? Well, if you think about it, when there's burgers on the grill, or fried chicken that's been freshly fried, you know what they smell like. And you know that your mouth waters and your stomach growls, you're ready to eat it. Mm, when we smell mystery meat or see mystery meat, our stomach makes noises too, but they're not usually good ones. So, some clues to help us know the difference. The same thing is true with knowing a false gospel from the real gospel. But to do that, we have to spend time with Jesus. We have to pray. And as we pray, listen to God as he speaks to and responds to our prayers. We need to do that daily. We also need to daily spend time in the gospel. We need to read the Bible and be in Bible study with other believers so that we can learn more about what his word truly says. And we also need to memorize scriptures so that when we need to know the gospel, we have some available to us, even if at the moment we don't actually have our Bible with us. So you see, if we'll do that, if we'll spend time in prayer, spend time reading and studying God's word, and spend time memorizing scripture, when we come across a false gospel, we'll be able to smell it a mile away. Boys and girls, I hope you have a great week this week, and until next time, God bless. Man, good stuff. I'm glad that Jesus Christ is not a mystery and he is the real thing and that's who we serve. So I invite you with us this morning. Go ahead and stand up and we're going to sing about him. And uh, I just invite you to join in with us. This is a great song and it's basically just John 3.16. So join in with us. The lyrics will be on the screen. Goodness, find what you're looking for.
special for you. This is a great song to our Lord and Savior because he's our King of Kings. team. Once again, you have blessed us and we're thankful for the ministry that you have here at Kinley. Well, good morning, everyone. If you would, turn in your Bibles to the book of Exodus. 
Exodus, the 16th chapter. Exodus chapter 16, in the first eight verses. So good to be with you on this beautiful Lord's Day. Let me just say, um, I got bad news and I got good news. Let me just give the bad news first. This is an incredibly long sermon. Uh, that's the bad news. The good news is I'm breaking it up over five different weeks. Uh, and so we'll only have a normal time this morning. Hey there, young man. So good to see you. Uh, and so I think they're headed for Children's Church in that direction. That's the cutest thing I've seen all day. <clears throat> there we go. So I want to, So if you'll notice, the, name, the, the title for this sermon is The Incredible Journey, Part 1. And I think as we go, you'll see why I'm, I'm, I'm doing just Part 1 today. And over actually a period of weeks, we're going to go through several parts on this. Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16, beginning at verse 1. If you're able to stand, please stand. Exodus chapter 16, beginning at verse 1. And they set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month, after they had departed from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we had sat by meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger." Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, <clears throat> I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. And on the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. And so Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel at evening, you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning, you shall see the glory of the Lord, because He has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you should grumble against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the morning meat to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling, that you grumble against Him. What are we? Your grumbling is not against us but against the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. We have, for those of you who are visiting, we've been going through the book of Exodus. And in the book of Exodus, it is the account of how God remembered the covenant He made with Abraham and his descendants. And so He sent Moses into Egypt to deliver the children of Israel out of the hands of the Egyptians. We've gone through ten plagues, and the ten plague culminated in the death of the firstborn. And all of Israel was protected from the tenth plague by the Passover lamb. The blood of the lamb is what protected them. And then after that, we saw last week that they were then delivered from the Egyptians once and for all as they crossed through the Red Sea, and it did not end well for the Egyptians. Now they are in the wilderness, and they are on a journey. And what should we understand from this? Well, it's very easy, and that is that the Christian life is a journey of faith. Uh, so, <clears throat> what are we to think about that? Well, John Bunyan was a Baptist preacher who lived uh, back in the 1600s in England. In 1660, he was thrown into prison because he refused to be licensed for preaching. You've got to remember, in England at, back then, uh, only the state, uh, unless one got a license from England, uh, the, the king of England, uh, it was not allowed to preach. Well, Baptists believe in separation of church and state, and he refused to get a license, and so he was thrown into prison. There he stayed for 12 years. What did he do during that time that he was in prison? He wrote a book called The Pilgrim's Progress. And it's a beautiful story in which he tells the life of a Christian as an allegory, as a journey. And so Christian leaves the city of destruction and heads to the celestial city. 
He is warned to flee the wrath to come from evangelist. And he leaves the city, and as he leaves, he's got this terrible burden of sin. It's a huge burden on his back, and he can't get rid of it. He goes to Dr. Law, and Dr. Law is not able to help him. In fact, Dr. Law just makes the load even heavier and bigger. And it isn't until he goes to Mount Calvary, and he looks upon the cross, that there the burden rolls away, and it rolls into an empty tomb, and there it disappears forever. And then he goes on a journey. You think, okay, well, it's great. Well, no. Then he goes into the slough of despond. Uh, and there he has all kinds of struggles. And he has characters who go with him, some that are helpful, like, like faithful and hopeful, others that are not so helpful, like Mr. Um, uh, like Pliable and, 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 and uh, Mr. H- uh, Ready to Halt. Uh, and so he goes through various places, like he goes to the slough of despond. He gets into the castle of despair. There in the castle of despair, How does he finally is delivered? Well, he finds a key, and the key is the promises of God. And so he unlocks and is able to flee from there, goes to Vanity Fair, he goes to the Meadow of Ease, uh, and all of the various stories and things. It's this fantastic story, and it presents the journey of faith as a literal journey. Where did he get that idea? Well, he got it from this text right here. We don't have to wonder how we as New Testament Christians are to apply these chapters because the Apostle Paul does it for us. Bring up the next slide. You have where the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he tells us the whole Exodus experience, how it's supposed to be applied to our lives. We're to understand the Passover as a metaphor, as an allegory, as a picture that points to the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus is our Passover lamb. And then he likens going through the Red Sea to being baptized. And then we're now on this journey of faith. Notice how he says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud. That's the pillar, that's the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by, by night. All passed through the sea. That's the, there you have the, 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 sea, the, the Red Sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And notice, they all ate the same spiritual food that we're going to talk about here in just a little bit. They all drank the same spiritual drink. And they all drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And notice how he interprets it Christologically. And that rock was Christ. Now, what does all of that mean for us? Look at verse 6. Now these things which took place as examples for us. So we are to look at these chapters and we're to understand them as examples and illustrations that you and I are to learn from, like an extended metaphor, an allegory, if you will. We're to learn from the lessons that we read in these chapters. And so what should we learn from what happens here? Well, let's take a look at chapter 15 and the very first thing we're to learn is the joy of salvation. In chapter 14, as I said, they were delivered. Uh, the, the Red Sea parted. Israel went through on dry ground. When the Egyptians followed, they drowned. And so chapter 15, you have where they're singing a song. It's the song of deliverance. It's the song of salvation. Let me just find out. How many of you here have been saved? You've been a Christian for longer than 10 years. Can you show me your hands? Okay, that's most of you. Fantastic. Now let me ask you, for those of you who've been saved for a while... Do you remember how wonderful it felt right after you got saved? Do you remember the joy? Do you just remember how great it was? I mean, you just thought, this is the the best thing that's ever happened to me or ever going to happen. And you were right. You were right about that. Because it is just so wonderful it felt to be saved. And so, really, this song has basically two verses. Verse 12 verses that you read here, it talks about the past. What is it that we've been saved from? And it talks about how I will sing, verse uh, verse 1, I will sing to the Lord, for He has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider He has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. And he says, verse 3, the Lord is a warrior. He is a man of war. And so the Pharaoh's chariots and his host He cast into the sea. Folks, my sins are gone. 
I have been forgiven. I have been washed in the blood. I am now a child of God. I now stand righteous, robed uh, in the righteousness of Christ. These are all the good and magnificent blessings that come from being saved. I am no longer condemned. I no longer have to worry about damnation. Sin no curse no longer is upon me. Sin's power is no longer over me. I am saved. I like being saved. I just want you to know, I really like being forgiven. I like being washed in the blood. I like being saved and knowing that I'm saved. This is great. That's what he's talking about. How good it means to be saved. So, that's the past. What about a believer's future? Well, that's verses 13 through 19. And let me just tell you something. For all of you that raised your hand, and even those who've been saved less than 10 years, let me just tell you, the future is glorious. It's magnificent. It's great. I promise you, no matter how tough or how difficult it is here today, it is magnificent what the future holds for each and every one of us. How glorious is it? It is as glorious as His promises. And how can we know that His promises are glorious? Because His promises are as good as His nature and His character. So what can I know? What are the promises? Well, I know, verse 13, that you and I are going to be guided by His steadfast love. Look at verse 13. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. And you have guided them. Folks, we are being led by God and this God loves us. He loves us with a love that's never going to diminish. It's never going to quit. It's never going to dissipate. This loving God is guiding us. Not only are we guided by His steadfast love, look at verse 16. We're protected by His strong arm. And then he talks about in the song of Moses about how all of those that are already in the promised land, land of Canaan, they're worried about what's happening because they've seen what's happened to the Egyptians. And it says so in verse 16, terror and dread fall upon them. Why? Because of the greatness of your arm. And so we are guided by God's love we are protected by God's strong arm. And what's going to happen? Well, verse 17 says it. We're going to be brought in and planted in His home, which is the sanctuary. In other words, folks, the ending is magnificent. In verse 17, you will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain. The place, O Lord, which you have made as your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. Folks, We've got a magnificent future for us. The new Jerusalem is awaiting us. We have a wonderful future. So how sure can we be about this? We can be sure as His eternal nature. Look at verse 18. The Lord will reign forever and ever. And so therefore, because He is the one true brute reality, the great I Am, we can trust all of His promises and His promises are great. And so we enjoy, first off, the joy of salvation. That's the very first thing that we know. In fact, that's one of the things we need to be reminded of. What was it at the church of Ephesus in the book of Revelation? They had lost their first love. And so every, every so often, ever so often, does this church ever have testimony meetings? Do you ever have testimony meetings? Well, you ought to have testimony meetings. I just want you to know that. Because it's good every once in a while just to stand up and remind yourself as you tell everyone about your salvation. It's good to be saved, folks. Remind yourselves of that over and over again. But, as we talk about the joy of salvation, that brings up the second point, And that is the bitterness of disappointment. So they go out into the wilderness... And uh, what happens? Well, <clears throat> for those of you who've been saved more than 10 years, I had you wait, raise your hand for a reason. And that is this. Do you remember the shock that you felt when you realized that God didn't seem to care about keeping you happy? It didn't seem to be a, to it didn't seem to be a priority. You know, God didn't seem to mind if, if, you, if you were no longer comfortable or you're no longer happy. Or you were dissatisfied about something. Uh, notice here what happens as they suffer 
the, the, the bitterness of disappointment. What's going on? Well, it's the anxiety of dwindling supplies. They go three days out in the wilderness and they run out of water. Look at verse 22. And then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea and they went into the wilderness of Shur and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. So now they're in, they're, they're, they're in, a, in, a, in, a, in a pickle. They're, they're, they're getting upset. They're, they're anxious. The supplies are running out. Now, listen to me. I had no idea whenever I plotted out the weeks that I was going to preach. I mean, I, I, I plotted this, 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 this out uh, uh, over a month ago that I was going to preach this message on this day. And I had no idea that we were going to go through a week in which we ran out of gasoline. Isn't it amazing the way people responded uh, whenever it looked like we're going to run out of gasoline? Did you see all of the social media pictures where people were, were getting as many five-gallon buckets or, 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 or cans as they could, hoarding gas as much as they could? Did you see the picture on social media? I guess it was real. The picture of the fellow who, in the trunk of his car, had filled up plastic bags with gasoline. That's not just dangerous, that's stupid. <laughs> and it says something about us as a culture and as a society that this is where we're at in terms of our fears and our anxieties. And let's remember, running low on gas is nothing compared to running low on water. I mean, it disadvantages us and creates difficulty. But it didn't put our life at risk and we acted like we were going to lose our minds. And so there is the anxiety of dwindling supplies. Then there is the frustration of dashed hopes. Verse 23, they finally arrive where there's some water, but it's undrinkable. Verse 23, when they came to Mara. They could not drink the water of Mara because it was bitter, and therefore it was named uh, Mara. This this reminds you uh, of uh, think of Ru Ruth chapter one, where Naomi and her husband and her two sons go down into Moab, and and there uh, Naomi's husband dies, and then both of her sons die, and so as she comes back, the only one she has coming back with her is Ruth. Her, uh, who is a Moabitess, uh, her, her step or her, her daughter-in-law. And when she comes back, they said, well, look, Naomi's back. And she said, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, because I am bitter. Now listen to me, folks. What's going on here is that it appears to the children of Israel that God seems to be guilty of poor customer service. Israel says, I want to talk to the manager. I mean, I want, to, I want to find out, let's find out who's in charge of this, and I want them to make it right. I put down good money, and I put down in my order long ago, and now I'm not getting the kind of service that I expected. And notice what's going on here, folks. They become bitter. They become anxious. Uh, and what's going on here is a very scary thing that we have to remember. When we become Christians, there is the joy of salvation. But it does not mean we will be exempt from the disappointments of life. And how you handle those disappointments will say a lot about your spiritual formation. Disappointment does not produce spirituality. Perseverance in disappointments builds spiritual formation. Disappointment without perseverance builds bitterness. In fact, that's what you need to realize. That these times of disappointment have a twofold purpose. What is that twofold purpose? Well, the first one is to test you. Verse 25. Look at verse 25. And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log, and he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. Good. Problem solved. But notice... There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule. And there He tested them. In other words, what was the purpose of this whole thing? 
It was a test. Think about all the way people have responded during the shortages and the difficulties. Reminded, <clears throat> think of a jar of vinegar getting upset and spilling and vinegar goes everywhere. Think of a jar of honey that gets upset and honey is spilt everywhere. Folks, <clears throat> it's not the upsetting. It's what was already in the container. When upsetting things happen, it doesn't make you act the way you do. No, when the upsetting thing happens, it reveals what's already on the inside. It's a test. It's a test. And you and I, during these times of disappointment, times of frustration, times of anxiety, we're to realize that the Lord is using these moments not only as a test, but He's using them also as teachable moments. Look at verse 26. Notice how He teaches them. He says, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, and do which is right in His eyes, and give ear to His commandments, and keep all His statutes, I will bring none of the diseases on you that I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. And so, let's recognize what the Lord is doing during these difficult times. During the times of disappointment and bitterness, God is testing us. God is teaching us. And then there's another good thing. Look at verse 27. In His time, He will supply. And they get to go to the twelve springs of Elam. Not only does He have one spring for them, He's got twelve of them. Uh, look at verse 12. And then they came to Elam where there were twelve springs of water and seventy palm trees, and they encamped there by the water. I like how Leland Riken says what he gave them. He gave them a month at Palm Springs. They got a month vacation. A month rest. Just, you know, and, and, and so here you have where the, the Lord blesses and provides for them abundantly. And what are we to learn from this? Folks, this is the point. Bitter times don't last forever. They're real and they're tough, but they're not permanent. And so what is the first thing we learn? That's the joy of salvation. Let's remind ourselves of that over and over again. Second, though, we need to understand, even before chapter 15 is over, even right after the song, there are the bitter times of disappointment. And then the third thing is the hunger for bread from heaven. And that's what I just read to you earlier in the first eight verses. Now, here's what we see where dissatisfaction is becoming a serious problem. Look at verse 1 and 2. It says, as they get there, <clears throat> verse 2, and the whole congregation of the people of Israel were grumbling against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And what were they grumbling? Look at verse 3. They had no right to say what they say in verse 3. They have, there's, it's inexcusable what they say in verse 3. It would have been better if we had died in Egypt. Really? Really? Well, yeah, back then they said we had, we had meat to eat and we had bread to the full. I have to confess something to you. Now, I just got through saying I like being saved. And I really do. I really do enjoy all the riches. I'm seated in heavenly places. I'm blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. My sins are forgiven. I'm a child of God. I've been adopted. I've been regenerated. I've got a glorious future. I look at all of the things I have in Christ. And I, we are more than conquerors. We, we, we are blessed. But there's been a time or two in my spiritual walk that I've looked back at Egypt, that I've looked back and said, I miss what I had in Egypt. Really, Ken? Don't you remember? That's where you die. It would have been better if we had died in Egypt. Oh, really? All of those things <clears throat> that you're remembering that were somehow good and that somehow you left behind and you still wish you somehow had them. Are you really thinking clearly? Don't you remember what it was like in Egypt? Egypt was a place of slavery. Egypt was a place of bondage. 
Egypt was a place of misery. Egypt was a place of condemnation. And notice what they're doing. They're grumbling. This is becoming a problem. Now how does God answer? He answers in a very gracious way. It's going to rain bread. Look at verse 5. I love our verse 4. Verse 4. Um, that's what the Lord says. And the Lord says to Moses, Behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you. I would have loved to have taken a picture of Moses' face when he heard God say that. What are you going to do? I'm going to make it rain bread. You mean that metaphorically, right? No! No, tomorrow morning, bread's going to fall from heaven. It's going to rain bread. Wow! Now, I have to say, I've never had it literally rain bread for me, but I've had the next best thing. Put something pretty close to it. You say, what do you mean? Well, when I was in college in Chattanooga, Tennessee, I was like 18 or 19, just a kid, and I got a job at McKee Bakery. McKee Bakery is where they make Little Debbie cakes. Y'all like Little Debbies? I mean, all of those kinds of things. I mean, all the different things. And I went to work night shift at, at, at McKee Bakery. And I can remember going through the, 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 the orientation for the new employees. And they're training us. And they're walking us through. And we go into the break room. And there in the break room. I love McKee Bakery. I mean, it's a great place to work. And, and, and I, I love all their stuff. In fact, I love... Uh, anything chocolate, you know, breaded chocolate cakes or anything like that, zingers, you know, all, all of those things. Uh, they're, they're magnificent. And um, we go into the break room and they have plastic tubs, multiple plastic tubs filled, heaping up with Little Debbie snakes. Or snakes, snacks. It's snacks, I promise you. Wrong sermon. That was an earlier one. Little Debbie, Little Debbie snacks. And they said, you can have all you want. You can't take them home with you, but during the break, you can eat all the snacks you want. To a, to a 19 year old guy, I said, Oh, wow, this is fantastic. This is the greatest thing in the world. I, I can't wait to go to work at McKee Bakery. I can't, little Debbie, I love you. And so, so, you know, break time comes. I rush into the break room. I tear into those. I'm scarfing them down. They are magnificent. One after another. I can eat all I want. And so I did. I ate and I gorged myself on Little Debbie cakes. Next break. I'm going to do it again. Lunch time. No problem. Little Debbie cakes. I ate. I just gorged myself my first night at Little Debbie cakes. Second night, I ate a lot. Third, I ate some. Within a week... Oh, I don't know. I had all that I wanted. It was raining bread. And that's what happens here. What is it that they have? Well, it's angel food. Look at verse 31. In fact, here's, it, it says in verse 31, and now the house of Israel called its name manna. manna. Now, here's, it, this is a Hebrew lesson. This is your second Hebrew word of the, of the, of the, of the sermon. It means, what is it? Now, mara means bitter. Manna means what is it? Now, we heard Miss Allison uh, talk about mystery meat. Uh, that, that's what is it in a bad way. Uh, this is what is it in a good way. They're all wondering, what in the world is this? Well, <clears throat> they have a hard time actually saying. And so they just try to describe it. Look at verse 31. It was like coriander seed, white, and it tasted like wafers made with honey. So the closest thing I can say is wafers and honey. But they said it was really good. It was magnificent. Um, I mean, it's better than a Little Debbie cake. Or it's better than a Krispy Kreme donut. It's just the best the person could ask for. What's it pointing us to? It's pointing us to Jesus. Jesus is our manna. He is the bread of life. In fact, in John chapter 6, Jesus repeatedly says, I am the bread of life. And in case you didn't get it, in John chapter 6 and verse 51, he says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Now here's the interesting thing. It only lasted for the day. Look at verse 19. He said, now, you're going to, no matter what you get, don't, don't ask for a to-go box. You're not going to have any leftovers. Don't put it in the refrigerator. You only have that which is for the day. Look at verse 19 in chapter six. Uh, whoops, uh, in chapter 16. 
He says in verse 19, uh, And Moses said to them, Let no one leave any of it over till the morning. But they would not listen to Moses. But some left part of it till the morning, and it bred worms and stank. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. What's going on? What, what's it trying to teach? It's trying to teach something very powerful about what it means to walk with God in a day-by-day -day way. I'm enjoying being here this morning. Just want you to know, I have enjoyed church all morning long. I, you know, I want to say to Donna and the worship team, man, I just love listening to you sing. I love getting to see the people of God and say hi to my brothers and sisters in Christ, catch up with everybody on the week. That's good. Love to be in here and hear Bobby pray and just, just enjoy uh, the, the blessings that a Sunday morning worship has for us as the children of God. But I got news for you. I'm going to need something again tomorrow and again the next day. That our walk with God is a day-by-day -day thing. It's not like, I mean, we've done, I mean, I've done Thanksgiving meals just like you where I ate so much that as I pushed away from the table, I said, I'll never be hungry again. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. Every day, we need fresh bread. Every day, we need to hear from God again. Every day, we need to begin that day with the Lord and with new mercies every morning. That's the point, folks. That's what these, this is teaching us. God will provide. He will bless. He will give you everything you need. But it's a daily thing. It's an ongoing thing. And you cannot live on yesterday's blessings. Every day, daily, you and I are to have this kind of relationship with God. We're not supposed to be like the fellow who, who uh, you know, never said he loved his wife. And they said, you know, why don't you, don't you ever say I love you to your wife? I told her I loved her on the day we got married 20 years ago. And it's until, you know, until that changes, it's still good. No, 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 no. Every day. Every day. And so it is with our walk and our relationship and fellowship with God. And so what are we to learn from all of this? The journey's difficult. It's difficult. That's the conclusion, but it's worth it. It's worth it. And so yes, we're to remember and enjoy the joy of salvation. We're to be warned about the times of disappointment and bitterness. And we're to desire fresh bread from God every day. And when you do that, the lessons we'll learn is, is that it is God who saves. And let's not whine and gripe. And He will guide. He will take our sorrows. And Jesus is our fresh bread and our water. Father in heaven, I thank you that all of these things that happened to them were examples for us. And it reminds us once again that this is an arduous journey, but what a glorious trip it is. You make everything worthwhile. Lord, you are the gift of the gospel. We have Jesus. And Lord, help us to always remember that's enough. And so Lord, I pray that you bless us now. In Jesus' name, and amen. As you remain seated, Jason is going to sing a song that fits in very well to what we've been covering this morning. As his, this song is based on the song of Moses there in Exodus 15. As he's going to sing about the song of Moses and how it should be applied for us today.
belongs Christ the Lord our conquering King your name we raise your triumph sing oh praise the Lord our mighty warrior praise the Lord the glorious one by his hand we stand in victory by his name we mighty warrior. Aren't you grateful for that? Thank you, Jason, for reminding us of that. I just want to commend all of the, all who have given uh, gifts, uh, uh, goods, canned goods and paper products uh, for the children's home. Let me remind, uh, for some of you who are still intending to do that, be sure and, and, and bring that in as soon as possible. Let's all stand and we'll be dismissed. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, once again, we've enjoyed your blessings, being able to gather around your word and, and be reminded once again about the living word. We're thankful for the journey of faith and the walk that we are on and that our brother, the Lord Jesus, our, our, our guide is before us and he is always with us. Your spirit is always with us. And so Lord, I pray that as we are dismissed, all this week we'll walk by faith. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name and amen. God bless you all. Be careful on your way home.